Hello and welcome to the fifth part of this tutorial series where we're going to learn how to change um, this kind of mesh which we get from the cellular automata, the point cloud of the cellular automata, uh, how we can change that with and substitute it with the mesh that we got from our first tutorial that we did, this kind of uh, triply periodic minimal surface. So the th first thing that I want to do is I want to merge these two files together uh, and all I need from this file right here uh, is just my regular mesh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide my preview here and all I care is about is just this <coughs> single mesh segment that I know that works. So I'm going to bake it out. Let's go for default layer move it slightly sideways and copy control C and paste it here in this file control V right. um, and that's all I need from the um, from the file of my previous tutorial so I can just simply close it so now I have this kind of a segment and I want to substitute all of my point data here with this segment, right? To be located right, like uh, every point should be a center point of this element. As it is right now, this element is way too big, right? <clears throat> for, for this grid. So first thing that I need to do is I need to um, scale it down so that it fits within the voxel grid that I'm using. In this case, if I <coughs> if I check here uh, the grid spacing, um, my voxel grid spacing is uh, 10 units, 10 millimeters. So I'm just simply going to select my shape, type in, well, uh, create a bounding box of it. And scale it inside of the bounding box so that the side of my bounding box is 10 units and then I can just delete uh, the bounding box right so now I have this shape that should um, as it tiles it should tile perfectly in order of this grid of this three-dimensional voxel grid next thing to do is I, I don't really need to see the mesh anymore, so I have this disabled. All I care about are these points right here. And actually, uh, I'll just build another data dam, a separate one for these points, because that's going to be a pretty um, heavy uh, script that we're going to run. I'm going to group it. Like that, Oop. like that. Um, let the information through, and I'll just create a point uh, container to to hold all these points here. So now I don't need to see the fuzzy uh, preview anymore, the point cloud preview. <coughs> so now when I have these points here, and I have this uh, element here, the first thing that I want to do is I want to reference it in. So uh, that's a mesh, so I'll just create a, a mesh container, right click, set one mesh, click on it, and I have it here in the in Grasshopper. And I can move it anywhere, I'll just move it somewhere closer to the 000 coordinates. So now how do we uh, move this element on top of each of these points? Right? Uh, for this to work I need a center point. Of this element, so I'm going in Grasshopper. I'm going to ask for a bounding box, bounding box, like that, and then I can either uh, ask for a volume, which will give me a center point, or I can evaluate um, the box according to UVW coordinates. But I guess just asking for a volume should do the trick. Because it gives us the uh, volumetric centroid. So then I can disable this. And if I check here, um, the centroid is located 
right in the middle of my right in the middle of my model right there so then what I want to do is I want to move this mesh that I have here from this center point to all of these points so I need uh, I will need to use a move command move um, the geometry that we're moving is our mesh and then the, for the target vector I need a bunch of these vectors right so um, what I'm going to do is in the vector tab I'm going to create a vector between two points um, vector 2pt right so my point A would be my centroid and my point B would be the, the, the point cloud that I have here and it creates uh, a vector between my center and all of these uh, points that I have here <coughs> to preview it I can use vector display tool uh, which will ask me for an anchor which is my center and the vector which is this guy so now I can see um, by how much I'm going to move and it seems to be correct. So I'm going to simply move it. Uh, I'll delete the, the, the vector display and I'll use these uh, vectors that I have as my translation vectors for my move. Do the mesh join command on it. It's going to give me a pretty heavy mesh, right? 400,000 faces. So I need to reduce the, the amount of polygons that I have here in this uh, starting mesh. Actually, I'm going to come back to my. Um, Come back to my initial uh, shape and I'll just remesh it. Let me just open it up. Load up Grasshopper. the corresponding definition for it and here instead of using uh, let me hide this and preview this guy here instead of using um, subdivisions that I have which are right now set to 5 um, I'll, I'll be using something like 3 right? which, will, which will make it a much much uh, a uh, mesh that's much much less dense and then I can uh, simply bake it out again like that move it sideways control C again go back to my file my, my cellular automata file control V same thing bounding box scale it down from here to here I need 10 units delete the bounding box <clears throat> and move it here so here I can see that <clears throat> this mesh has far less uh, vertices than this one which is in this case it's great for us uh, so I'm going to re-reference the low polygon mesh um, so set one mesh this guy and it's going to now give me 140,000 140, uh, polygons, which is manageable, right? Uh, 400,000 was way too much. So I can just simply delete the high polygon version of it. All right, uh, so I have this done and I have them all joined up with mesh join. Now I need to 
uh, take care of the seams between them. Right. Uh, if I now check for naked vertices, and I just look at the naked points, I can see that all of my seams between the elements are um, being read as the naked points, so I need to fix that. Uh, fixing it is just simply using a line, uh, not a line, sorry, um, weld mesh weld vertices. With the default threshold, it should work. Uh, so let's just see. Uh, the joint mesh gets welded, and now let's the naked points and you can see here as I connect it now <coughs> there are no naked points on the seams that's great um, once I've done the line it seems that the shading uh, started, started messing up so I'll just use um, combine and clean function um, which should give us back the correct shading. There we go. Okay, so now when I have this kind of naked point uh, checking done, I can just simply delete, delete, and continue on with my definition. Um, so now next thing to do is to uh, fix the seams so that they are smooth, right? Um, I can do this by um, either using Catmull Clark, which will partially smooth it out, or I can do this by using um, uh, by using Mesh Smooth tool. So I'll use the Mesh Smooth or Smooth Mesh, um, and this one is uh, going to be quite heavy. So I'm going to build another data dam right here. I'll let the information through, I'll group it up, like that. So now for mesh smoothing, even with one iteration you can see how much, well let me preview the unsmooth version, so that's the unsmoothed version and that's the smooth one, how much it smooths out. Um, so this tells me that the settings that I have here are almost correct. Um, but perhaps I want to have a bit more iterations of smoothing. So instead of using one iteration, I'm going to use 10, which will uh, make it so that this is this becomes quite a heavy uh, tool. Right. But it smooths, smooths it out. Right? Um, and now the next thing to do is to apply uh, the Catmull Clark subdivision to get rid of this jaggedness of these edges. So if I use Catmull Clark subdivision, plug in the mesh, hide that one. Hmm. Seems that it's still uh, not smoothing it out properly. Let's use the Let's check for naked edges again, naked vertices, and I'll check before I smooth, so I'll check the after the mesh cleanup, the naked points. Seems like this is correct. So that's it. that is how it, how it should be. Okay. Let me create a custom preview. Like that. Uh, I'm just visually checking for any discrepancies, any weird uh, connections that I would have here. But everything seems to be quite clean. So I can move on. Um, there are some uh, meshes here that are separated from uh, the other ones. I can simply uh, fix them by um, asking for the vertex count, so deconstructing 
uh, the mesh before smoothing uh, right after we use the mesh cleanup I can deconstruct the meshes and ask for list length of vertices so basically asking how many vertices do we have in each of these meshes oh sorry um, that won't work <laughs> uh, we need to go back even more before we join join up the meshes or rather after we join up the meshes we need to separate them again um, so let's use uh, let me go to the mesh tools utilities and here we should have this joint mesh tool so basically what this one does it separates the meshes after they've uh, been uh, joined up uh, in, in accordance to um, basically the, the, the naked points right so here we have the naked points the seam so that this doesn't work but after we use the weld this should give us six meshes in total which is kind of strange let's see using the list item tool I can uh, go through these six edges, uh, six meshes, and check whether or not they're. Which makes it so that this one is completely separated. So that's correct. This one as well. This whole portion that and that. okay so what I need to do is I need to, to take the biggest mesh of these right so I'm going to ask for the list length of my vertices and I'm going to flatten out the output and I'm going to sort ah, sort the list and together with the list I'm going to sort my uh, disconnected meshes right. in doing so I get the meshes with least amount of vertices in the top of the list and the meshes with most vertices in the bottom so I'll just simply right click and reverse the order of the list so that I have right in the top I have my um, meshes with most vertices and I'll just make some room here <clears throat> and I'll get the with list item I'll get the mesh from the top of the list meaning the one with the largest amount of vertices right. and I can connect it now to the mesh cleanup run it through the data dam again and click the preview so that's that's my mesh right? that's that's the mesh that I have right now it's very dense um, and for this to be 3d printable um, it, it just simply won't work so I need to make it a bit smaller so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, sorry I, I need to make the grid a bit smaller so that I can enlarge it right, so what I'm going to do is for the grid xy amount I'm going to use let's go for grid and I'll adjust the the, the, the rectangles here let me re-reference check the point cloud let's just see how the mesh looks like the cellular automata mesh how it looks like if, if that's okay for us it seems to be okay let me disable preview of that and run it through the data down where we substitute our point cloud with the meshes let's preview how it looks like here 
seems to be okay. Run this here. And let's just check the final geometry preview. Right. So that's a smoothed out version. So now I need to give it some thickness. Um, giving it thickness after you've done the Catmull Clark subdivision is pretty, it gets pretty intense uh, for the machine to handle. So I'll do that in between the mesh smooth and the Catmull Clark. I'll just go to uh, Viewbird, Transform, Viewbird's Mesh Thicken. And then I can give it like one millimeter or something like that. So I'll use like 1.2 millimeters. And then I'll smooth it out. In doing so, I end up with a mesh like this. Which is uh, pretty thick. So, um, in this way, if I were to now check, you know, the, the, the size of it, it's going to be like 8 by 8 centimeters and 8 in height. Um, so I want to uh, have a bigger control over the, the size at which I'm going to uh, print this out. So I will not be... Um, Right here, I just showed you how to do it in Grasshopper, but I'm actually going to do it in, in Rhino. So I will not be using Mesh Thicken or Catmull Clark subdivision. I'll just simply, I'll, I'll be baking out this geometry right here. Bake default. Okay. This geometry right here. I'll be giving it a bounding box and I'll scale the bounding box according to the um, highest size that I can get. So I'll just scale it and let's say from here to here I want to have 150 millimeters. So it's actually, it actually becomes pretty, pretty big. If I now ask for mesh offset or offset mesh wait for it to cache in all of the vertices oh. Turn back here and I'll give it offset distance of 1.2 millimeters yeah as I mentioned before it's going to become quite quite heavy 1.2 solid delete and put meshes hit offset and it thickens it out right? So here I can check whether or not it's a decent closed mesh or not. So I'll just click on it, type in what, and it's going to see closed to double precision polygon mesh. That, that's fine. That, that means it's 3D printable. <coughs> if I uh, don't like the sharp edges here, uh, I can smooth them out by re-referencing the mesh again into Grasshopper. giving it a Catmull Clark subdivision and baking out and baking out the Catmull Clark um, output. Let's make it out back to default. So now I'll just simply select the denser mesh, move it to the side <clears throat> and that's the mesh that uh, we're going to print out. 
So I'll just simply select it, export, select the STL format. Um, I'll, I'll just call this uh, YouTube tutorial five. Save. And it's going to be 96, uh, 92.6 megabytes. So that's a pretty, pretty heavy file. Uh, while we wait for this to export, I'm going to type in Cura, uh, load that one up. Yep, so this is my file. I can just simply uh, drag and drop it into Cura. Wait for it to load up. Now, apparently it doesn't fit in my TiVo Tarantula, but we're using the Prusha i3 uh, Mark 3s. So I'm going to change the printer and definitely does fit in the printer. I'm going to rotate it like so, so that it fits better uh, on, on the build plate. Basically you always want to have this kind of conical shape upwards. And then I'm going to uh, change some quality settings. 0.2 layer height is fine, uh, we can use that. Shell wise, wall line count two, top layers four and four. Uh, that's okay. We can uh, deal with three top and three bottom layers. That that should be more than enough uh, in strength wise. Infill density twenty percent doesn't really matter because all of this is just a shell, um, so it's not going to use a lot of infill. Material two hundred sixty degrees. That's fine. Speed. Print speed, uh, let's go to for 50 millimeters per second. Uh, trial speed 180, initial layer speed. I'll drop this down to 25 to make sure that it sticks. Z hop when retracted, yes. Z hop height 0 0.6. Cooling on support. The support should be generated. And let's use the support overhang angle of 70 degrees. Build plate adhesion, brim. Brim line count should be, yeah, 20. 20 seems fine. Um, everything else should be turned off. Let's hit prepare. And it's going to take a little bit of time slicing it up. Okay, so it finished slicing it. Um, and it seems that it's going to take three days to complete and that's way too much um, so we're going to look at how we can optimize this uh, let's just look at the layers a little bit it probably has something to do with the size that we're uh, using for the, the, the scale that we're using uh, so we're probably going to go back here to Rhino and uh, change them all a little bit. Let's just see the layers first. Oh wow, okay. So Removing the, uh, the the supports from from this kind of structure is going to be very hard to do. Uh, so what we want to do uh, is basically we want to somehow create a structure that's less deep. Um, so I'm going to delete this. Delete. I'm going to go back to my 
uh, Rhino. I'll delete this guy. <clears throat> and let's just see what, what we can change. Right. So this structure as it is now is uh, way too way too dense. Um, and we have way too many elements. And also scaling it up to fit in 15 by 15 centimeter bounding box uh, is try and play around with the either the birth and death uh, values or just simply with the height with the pure height of it so first things first height let's uh, reduce like five rerun it hit the play button play button here so it trims off the top it seems to be something that's more manageable and then I'm going to change <coughs> change up the pattern a little bit so what I'm going to do is I'm going to place it here this guy probably here and this guy I'm going to place somewhere here so basically what I'm forming is this kind of a line here and my hopes is that it's going to start growing from from this particular line segment and in doing so it's going to give us a more um, let's say conical and flat uh, geometry to work with or point cloud to work with so I'll just click on the play button again here and here there we go so even though this grew quite a bit uh, in this direction but it seems to be um, it seems to give us this kind of a opening here which we can uh, later on use to remove the supports from both this part portion and this portion right here so this works better um, I'm going to bake out this mesh Again, so uh, at this point, this is just simply repeating the, the things that I did before. Like that. I'm going to create a bounding box around it. And I'm going to say that the side here, let's scale it. The side here shouldn't be uh, 15 centimeters. That was way too big with three days of printing. Uh, let's go for... Uh, Let's go for 120 millimeters, something like that. And then I'm going to select it, use the mesh offset tool, or sorry, tool. And I'm going to give it uh, some sort of a thickness. So again, this this is a pretty pretty heavy mesh to use. But let's just hit offset, thickens it. And actually, I prefer the the, the sharp corners here. So I'm going to keep them. I'm, I will not be using the Catmull Clark subdivision that I showed with with this guy. So I'm going to use this export um, and let's try YouTube tutorial 5 smaller mesh hit save so now it's 20 megabytes Oop. go to Cura or either drag it into your Cura slicer upside down like that seems to be much nicer um, always try to find um, a version where it's going to have the least amount of overhangs possible 
So in this case, yeah, these guys are floating, uh, but I think the surface area here is the largest. And also I'm going to say that um, since the edges here are not completely flat, I, I want to move these guys down a little bit. So I'm going to use a uh, move tool and for Z I'm going to use like, I'll just use minus one millimeter so that the bottom gets uh, cut away a little bit. In doing so I'll just get a bit more uh, surface area that's touching and I'll make sure that the mesh um, prints better. So let's go for uh, prepare again. Okay, so now this one is a much more reasonable um, it produces a much more reasonable print time. It's still one uh, one day 17 hours uh, which is quite high uh, so let's just see how we can uh, reduce this a little bit and check the layers okay quite heavy uh, when it comes down to uh, the, the, the supports I'm just going to make sure that I have uh, support set to 70. Yeah, it's set to 70 degrees, so that's that's accurate. So let's just see whether or not if we use higher quality, uh, lower quality, if we can get something a bit uh, faster. So I'm going to do 0 0.3 millimeter layer height. Hit prepare. Okay, uh, changing it to 0.3 millimeters layer height dropped it down below um, one day, which is great. Uh, then we can just simply remove the show helpers here and just see how how the mesh is going to look like, right? In in the smallest details that we have. It seems to keep all of the details that I had uh, in my 3D model. So we're going to, yeah, we're going to stick to something like this. Right. Once you're done with this, simply save your G-code files and you can start printing.